Here is the result after re-simulating and remeshing. So I was able to get quite a bit more detail in there and also get uh, some ocean displacement that I thought looked better scale-wise to the and also some displacement that I thought suited more our scenario, if you will. Uh, a bit faster speed and uh, better scale of the details in proportion to the action. So now we got back to that um, the action. It's kind of sweeping like a sheet on top. Really just like a pretty nice detail there. And we ended up at, uh, I think it's like 11 million polygons, which is not too bad, and around like 21 million particles or something like that. So it took a couple of minutes per frame, and that's something you sometimes have to live with uh, for hybrid of things. And I also switched it around, you know, before I had this one in the middle, and I had one repetition here, one repetition here, one repetition here, and now I figured that... We're going to shoot it from, well, I'll show you in Maya, but I don't think we're going to see anything here. And we mainly just needed two repetitions over here to kind of have it reached outside of the camera frustum. So, without further ado, I will jump to Maya. And I haven't done anything here except uh, create a project. So, I just want to make sure that this is now at my frame rate. And I want to set it to 125 frames. And I'm going to use, I should maybe have mentioned this before, but when it comes to real flow meshes into Maya, and I suspect other packages as well, I know in the standalone apps for, for Cinema and Maya, I know that you can mesh and get velocity information, but as we all know, the most important thing about the look of the water is motion blur. And if you want motion blur, you're going to need one of two things. Either uh, an alembic that has velocity channel baked into the mass mesh as point colors. And even though real flow by default is set to alembic and velocity, this does not work. It's kind of, I see it as a bug in the software. Uh, there are ways to fix that, which uh, I can show you, but uh, honestly, I think I will have to break this out into a separate video because it gets a little too specific. To be brutally honest, we're not going to be able to do uh, exactly what I had in the video, which is um, this part where we're using the velocity and we're plugging that into a blend between two different materials. And there are different shaders you can put on that, but the main thing is that the blend between those two materials is controlled by the vertex colors, but we're not going to get vertex colors into Maya. The information is there in the file, but it's not stored correctly. So, um, and since the information is not in the file, we can't uh, render with motion blur either, because that's needed. If you have a, a mesh that is changing on every a frame, the topology is changing on every frame, then you need velocity information, but we can't get that. So we're going to use the real flow standard bin format. Uh, and the reason we're going to do that is because then when you import, you can see that my real flow shelf here is empty. So I'm just going to have to reload the plugin that sometimes happens and just refresh the shelf. So then I will use this, instead of using the built-in Alembic importer in Maya, I will use the RealFlow uh, RF Connect uh, mesh importer. And when we do that, we get an additional node. Let's see when we select, uh, you can see it here already. We got a RealFlow mesh source node. And that node is going to sort of handle the motion blur for us, pretty much. So, um, yeah. If you take a look here, uh, it has a motion blur multiplier. So regardless of how they're storing their data in, in like the Alembic format, it's not in a standard way that Maya likes to have that information stored. It just doesn't work. So regardless, it's going to work with the bin file. So the default is Alembic, and if you're going to render in Maya and want motion blur, then I would set it to bin. 
or keep an eye up for my upcoming tutorial hint hint that I'm gonna make. So here we are and let's grab the animation as well. Gonna get rid of everything but the letter B. I'll set the edges to harden which is going to give us some faceting on the curvature, but I don't really care about that right now, to be honest. And uh, some information to be handling, so it's not going to be, you know, very interactive when it comes to like scrubbing the timeline and things like that. But let's just hide the liquid mesh and just figure out kind of the framing. I will just use the resolution gate up here, and then in case you have. Like if I turn off my node editor in this case, now I see like this is exactly the the cropping for my specific format, which is HD, and it's actually half HD, but it doesn't really matter because the aspect ratio is the same when we bring it up to full HD. So we don't really need to care about that for now. And I'm just gonna check how we're framing this. I think what I'll do is I will bring back the mesh, and it's a little slow to handle. You know, um, I, I think I'll just create a plane that's as big as the mesh. And then we will uh, use that when we're framing the shot. Here we go. And now I want to create a new camera. But first we can maybe frame this in a way we think is going to work. Let's not hide away those hard-earned extensions too much. <laughs> uh, we could also animate the camera if we want to. I want to... So this is a start. So I'll go uh, create camera from you. That's going to give me a new camera, which I'm going to call running cam. And I'm already looking through that camera. Maybe we want to use something like a 50 millimeter focal length which is gonna get us a little more zoomed in which is gonna allow us to stay clear of that edge over there yeah I mean it's totally undistinguishable we don't see anything <laughs> but uh, yeah let's maybe have it slightly further out so we get a clear view of everything I'm just using the Shift W and Shift E keys, which is what I do when I'm really lazy or I'm just doing something quick and dirty. Shift W to set all the transforms and uh, translations, and Shift E to set keyframes on all the rotations. Cool, I might want it to land a little sooner though. So let me just grab all of these keys and just move them up to frame or so. I'm gonna delete that plane now. I'm gonna use the same approach as in RealFlow, turn off under show, turn off selection highlighting, and here we can see some of the detail. I think this is gonna be pretty nice. And first things first, uh, as far as lighting goes, I want to use Redshift and the Sun and Sky that they have. And by default, the Sun and Sky is going to be like on, a, on the noon of a day, full bright noon. So I will kind of tilt that down and rotate it. Like this should bring the light in at a more interesting angle to kind of illuminate highlights and so on. As far as shading goes, I'm just going to use uh, a redshift material. And we're going to use the water preset. And then we're going to go down to subsurface and use the transmittance color to add some kind of like a watery blue or green and pull down the brightness a bit. This is going to make so the water doesn't look transparent like a drinking glass or something like that, which is not realistic for a shot like this. So maybe, let's just maybe have one frame right now, or an IPR.
so I think it looks pretty cool. It's really dark here on this side. And that's because we don't have any illumination from the sky itself yet, uh, which you need to enable GI to get. So I'll just go to GI in the render settings and turn on brute force for now, because that's the only one that works with the IPR that I'm running currently. So that's cool. I don't need a secondary bounce. I'm going to run this pretty simple. Let's just apply some kind of shader on the letter. I think I'll go with, you know, pretty much the standard uh, preset for plastic. Plastic, let's give it a color that looks like an emergency buoy or something like that. And let's set reflection roughness a bit. It's not going to be too visible because there aren't any smooth surfaces on that object. Uh, let's get a bit more of a dusky mood by bringing the sunlight down at a lower angle. Maybe not too much, but yeah, something like that. Cool. I think I can live with this. Uh, the main thing which is left is to first of all check this with motion blur. It's not super fast moving fluid, but we should definitely have motion blur around the areas here. So what we want to do is we want to enable under output the motion blur and enable deformation blur. I'm going to leave it to default settings and do a test render. I typically don't meddle with IPRs when I enable deformation blur, at least not yeah, at least not deformation blur, because it just takes a long damn time to update and I don't really I think it's just easier to do a bucket render and wait for it. The main thing that takes a long time here is translating the scene data and translating the deforming meshes. This is um I mean, if, if it's like an Alembic, for example, you would do very well by exporting that Alembic to uh, a relative proxy, which then is going to go, like the time to first pixel is just going to go to zero instantly. Uh, and then it fetches the mesh for each bucket it renders instead. So it's just the same data, it's just stored in a much more efficient way for you. So... Uh, but when it comes to the real flow bin file and when you want to use meshing, uh, well, I mean motion blur, I find that the last time I tried it at least gave me quite a bit of artifacts. So I don't think it's a viable option. So we have whatever motion blur we're going to get. Um, not too much of an effect. Uh, but what I wanted to point out, like I said, first of all, who knows if we're even going to see it at the frame that we're test rendering on. But what I do want to point out is typically when you want to play with the effect of your motion blur, you want to come in here and you want to play with your steps and your duration. So you might double this to get longer streaks or anything. As soon as you start playing with frame duration here, real flow motion blur is not going to work anymore. So you need to keep that to one and you need to go to the real flow mesh source instead and play with this value, the motion blur multiplier. So I could maybe exaggerate this and see if we get something. Uh, maybe I think the letter stops at 100. So let's go to maybe like 102 because I think there's some liquid splashing up against it. So let's maybe render frame 102 instead. So I just went over the playback again just to figure out a frame because 102 was not a good guess. I think here around like frame 113 looks a lot better so let's see if this frame can give us a better hint of what our motion blur looks like and then i guess we'll just um, set a few render render um, sample settings and pump this thing out that was a way better frame to be looking at uh, but as i was hoping the render motion blur multiplier uh, proved to be quite excessive so we need to find the right amount let's go down to two and render again it does. 
it becomes a bit unresponsive when you change it uh, for a while. So I guess it's kind of like trying to pre-sample the motion blur in some kind of way under the hood. I did actually once try to export this information into a proxy and it ended up uh, exponentially larger than the single frame mesh size. So I think it, it can do some kind of interpolation in between there. I went from a couple of hundred megs per frame to like two gigs per frame of the mesh. Which uh, is a good point. I wanted to show you also what we can expect in file sizes while we're waiting for the render. So I just want to make su sure that I only have the current version. And you can see that um, about a gig per frame is not uncommon for something like this. So the particle cache alone is 125 gigs. And then there's also fields, like I mentioned, this, this Hybrido engine uh, calculates uh, a voxel grid and then it uh, populates that with particles so first of all there's a voxel grid but those files are lighter so this one is 32 gigs and the mesh uh, sorry the particles are 124 gigs and the mesh is 55 gigs so all in all this project uh, weighs around uh, I haven't started rendering yet so we can just look at the whole folder it weighs about 215 gigs right now and then when I start uh, rendering out EXRs I guess if I do the moon float and a bunch of AOVs then we might end up uh, slightly higher but that's kind of like what you can expect and sometimes I've been asked you know is it enough to get a 512 gig um, SSD or something like that typically not really um, you would want a project folder of at least a thousand gigs. Um, I have my in. I have all of my current projects on a terabyte SSD, uh, which I think is really nice to have. Uh, but you could also like for a fraction of the cost for that one, you can get like a four terabyte uh, mechanical drive, which as long as you get a seven seventy two hundred RPM, I think it's 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 not bad, you know. But an, an SSD is always better. Uh, yeah, so here is the motion blur multiplier of 2, looking significantly better. Notice also that the transmittance color is only acting in these areas, and when the mesh is thinner, it's not acting, so we see through, which is a nice effect, which looks a little realistic. I think I'm going to stick with something like this, a motion blur of multiplier of 2. And... Um, it's a little noisy right now. Uh, pretty much most of the water looks fine, but uh, the B is affected by GI. So we'll just up the brute force GI race, and I will go to uh, the unified sampling, and I will set the max to, let's say, 256, and I will set my overrides slightly higher. So let's see what kind of render time we can expect on a single frame and if we can get rid of all the noise. 12 seconds, but that's only because uh, I have already uh, translated and deformed everything. So um, let's just <laughs> change the frame and we're going to see that whole pre-processing stage. Uh, the time to first pixel is really what's taking time. But as you can see, it's really cheap to sample this image. Uh, so I don't really need to be too concerned about pumping up the settings there. I also, to be fair, I want to be looking at the correct render size. So I'll do a 1080 for this. I'll only render my render cam. And this process is pretty similar if you're doing V-Ray, uh, because Redshift is built very similarly to V-Ray. I recognize a lot of things from V-Ray. So if you haven't been looking into Redshift yet and you're sitting in an environment where you're kind of rendering a lot of stuff by yourself or you're in a small studio or something like that, I would definitely look into GPU rendering with Redshift rather than uh, going the classic CPU route because, man, it's really fast. So only with a machine like this that I have, which has uh, two 1080 Ti's and a standard 1080, I can run the Redshift benchmark below uh, five minutes, actually, which is um, a pretty heavy uh, high-end CG scene if you haven't 
check that out. It's one of those uh, beautiful shots that Tony Bredenshevich did. And uh, it's, you know, there's a bunch of characters and a lot of different depth and a lot of complicated shaders and uh, depth of field and high sampling and glossy reflections and everything. Um, so it is a really powerful render engine that you definitely should check out if you haven't already. So it's starting to render now and done with the pre-processing. So still, I mean, pretty much unchanged <laughs> render time. I had, uh, yeah, it's the time to first pixel, which is really the, the thing here in this shot. Uh, you'll see that we still have the issue with the, kind of like the micro bumps. We could have spent some more time in real flow trying to smoothing, smoothing that out. I'm going to be setting a depth of field here <coughs> before we go for final frame. And that might kind of uh, take away the focus of the change from this area to this. I guess one could also argue that the area around. I mean, I'm not gonna, f I'm not gonna look for excuses here. I think it looks kind of bad, but I think we can hide it with the, the depth of field. Um, another thing you could do is maybe you want to introduce some more details on the whole mesh. So maybe you want to go with a normal map, some kind of a fracture or something, and that's definitely gonna break that up even more. But uh, let's go to output and create a bokeh. And I'm going to set um, based on the distance from camera here. I'm just going to set that on the bokeh. So pretty much 21.8 or 22. I think the detailed, uh, sorry, the, I want to uncheck my motion blur now and um, go with an IPR once again. And I think the, uh, standard settings are going to be way too out of focus so let's try to find the proper ones this kind of helps make it look a little uh, miniature like which is nice I want to give it like a five blade or a six or seven blade so it mimics the look of a SLR camera and we want to do the radius. Um, by the way, uh, Redshift is really intelligent when it comes to like the node that you have open and then you click the help. It opens it and it kind of finds the node that you are currently on. So you can go to COC radius, for example, circle of confusion. How so we can see here that we might want to start bringing down the COC radius. And I also want to start lowering the power, like the overall, how much out of focus is everything going to be. Starting to find a nicer setting now. I'm kind of liking the fact that it is looking a little miniature-like because then actually maybe this shot makes sense. Then maybe we could have built a tiny plastic radio-controlled letter B and run it through a patch of water or something like that. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I'm not too concerned about the possibility of it. But it's a fun mind jog, if you will. So let's maybe have something like this. We have a pretty decent... Uh, up the field now. And I think we're actually good to kind of push the button on this and just export the whole thing. 
So I'm going to make sure that I have set my product folder and then click animation and my range. And uh, I'll just set the file name to the scene name. I always go with EXRs. In this case, I'm not going to do any AOVs or anything like that. So I'm just going to say uh, half load is definitely enough. I usually do some kind of compression. Zip 16 I think works pretty well. And that's pretty much it. We can go and the rendering menu and uh, batch render is going to pump this thing out for us. So I wanted to wrap this up by bringing you the final render and I think it turned out pretty well. A few disclaimers, we haven't done yet the velocity blending using uh, the vertex, the, po the point colors on the mesh uh, since that is currently not working as intended from RealFlow and I'll address that in a separate video. Another thing is I eventually I introduced a bit of denoising with the optics denoiser and since the render time was pretty fast I think I added an overhead of something like 80% which is what that value stands for when you go into the render settings uh, so with that I was able to pretty much um, before I did that I was adding a lot of uh, samples in the end and lowering the accuracy uh, lowering the threshold I mean uh, setting a very small threshold uh, so pretty much biasing the whole render to use very high samples into the thousands to get rid of the noise in the depth of field. And then in the end, I thought it was just better to add an optics smooth to get that out. And another thing, if you were paying attention, you saw that I picked the focus depth for the bokeh on the last frame. But obviously the B is closer to the camera in the first frame, which means that either you have to keyframe the focus distance or you can set up a focus pull uh, with just a distance between node which is something that I think I want to address in a separate video that I will bring up real shortly because that could be of interest to viewers other than those who find their way here based on hybrid uh, sims so I want to get that out to as many as possible because it's a really useful thing but all in all, I hope you agree with me that we were able to make this look a lot nicer than we would have thought in, in the beginning. And I hope that you can now see a little bit why I wasn't so concerned with, you know, the, the contrast in detail on the surface and the sim area and on the extension area. Because with kind of like a photographic render, it's not going to be too apparent anyway. So here we can look back at the mesh of it all and kind of see where we've come uh, from the beginning. And I hope you feel ready to kind of start taking the techniques here into your own projects and you know, do your own first hybrid sims and try this out, whichever uh, renderer you're using and create a mesh, create a big ocean plane, create displacements. I'd be stoked to see what you can create with the techniques I've mentioned in this tutorial and in the other tutorials. So feel free to hashtag Dave Splaining or mention me in any way in social media on Facebook through my Facebook page, Dave Splaining, or through Instagram, hashtag Dave Splaining, Twitter, uh, at Dave Splaining. So it'd be great to see what you can create with these techniques and I'd be happy to share your work. So this ended up a lot longer than I was anticipating, but then again, first time we were doing hybrid O, so I kind of wanted to cover a few things, and we still have, you know, uh, secondaries and other things to kind of cover. But with this underway, now that we have the basic sim settings and the basic mesh and all the features that distinguishes hybrid O meshes from the standard meshes, now we can kind of attack those in a more compartmentalized ways and keep the upcoming videos short and sweet, I hope. And the upcoming video, which is the letter C, I used the Magic Demon and I used Diverso. But what we're going to be focusing on is the Magic Demon to kind of make your liquid take the shape of another object. If you like this video and you think someone else might be interested in learning, feel free to like and share this video. I would love to have you a subscriber to this channel. And if you don't like the video, then feel free to let me know in the comments below or via Twitter at Dave Spinning or send me an email at uh, davesplaining at gmail.com and I would love to hear what you have to say. So all in all, thanks for tuning in. I hope you had fun and I'll see you in the upcoming tutorials. Bye.